Hello everyone, I'm Jo Ashbourne, the Director of the Cross Centre for the History and Philosophy of Physics, and I'd like to warmly welcome you all today to today's special event in association with Oxford's Department of Physics. We have over 400 people joining us today from all around the world, so good morning, good afternoon, and good evening across the time zones. We're delighted to welcome Dr. Mario Livio to speak on Brilliant Blunders, Mistakes by Great Physicists that Changed Our Understanding of the Universe. Mario is a renowned astrophysicist and best-selling author who's now based at the University of Nevada at Las Vegas. He's published more than 500 scientific papers on topics ranging from dark energy and cosmology to black holes and extrasolar planets. Mario is also the author of several popular science books, including the best-selling The Golden Ratio, for which he received the Pino Prize and the International Pythagoras Prize, and the book Brilliant Blunders. His recent book, Galileo and the Science Deniers, was selected by the Washington Post and Science News as one of the best books of 2020, and was a finalist for the 2021 Phi Beta Kappa Award in Science. And to top it all off, Mario has been nominated three times by the USA Science and Engineering Festival as one of their Nifty 50 speakers. Mario has kindly agreed to take questions after his lecture, and these can be typed into the Zoom Q&A box below. Mario, we're very much looking forward to your lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe, and uh, hello to everybody from uh, the distant Baltimore. So uh, the talk is based on my book, Brilliant Blunders, uh, From Darwin to Einstein. Uh, and, uh, you know, when I was writing this book, people kept asking me, um, what is your next book about? And I used to tell them it's about blunders and it's not an autobiography. Um, the next question usually that comes is why do you decide to write a book about blunders? And there are several reasons for that. Uh, one is a very simple one, which I will tell you right away. And the somewhat deeper one I will tell you towards the end of the talk. The simpler one is that uh, you know, it is sort of comforting to the rest of us to know that even some of the greatest uh, luminaries that ever lived uh, made blunders. And uh, so, you know, it's, it's, it's good to know that. Uh, and I've chosen uh, five giants to write about, but I will only talk about three today, the three that are physicists, because, you know, this is done in collaboration with the physics department. Uh, the five that I wrote about uh, were Charles Darwin, uh, Linus Pauling, um, Lord Kelvin, Fred Hoyle, Albert Einstein. And today, like I said, I will talk about the three, uh, the three physicists among them. Uh, there is one other thing I should say. Um, first of all, when choosing the people to write about, uh, well, first of all, I wanted them to be really, really, you know, great scientists uh, to show that these great scientists also make mistakes. Um, but also I decided not to go too far uh, back in time. You know, you know, I mean, if you take somebody like Aristotle, let's say, okay, who was undoubtedly a great genius. Well, <laughs> you know, almost everything he said in physics was wrong. Uh, so there are almost too many mistakes to choose from. Um, so I, I only went back to the 19th century. And also uh, I decided to concentrate just on one blunder that these scientists made. I mean, every person and every scientist included makes more than one blunder. Uh, so I decided not to do like a laundry list of all the blunders that these people made, but to concentrate on just uh, one of them. So let's start. And I will start with this gentleman here, which is uh, William Thompson, later known as Lord Kelvin. Uh, Lord Kelvin was undoubtedly uh, one of the greatest minds of the transition from classical physics into you know, what we may call the modern physics. Um, no question about that. Um, he, um, his original name was William Thompson. Uh, uh, he chose the name Lord Kelvin, uh, named after the Kelvin River, 
which ran uh, right uh, next to his lab uh, at the University of Glasgow, um, as it is shown here. Um, he was already a very gifted uh, mathematician uh, as, as a young person. Um, uh, there is a famous story that, uh, you know, at Cambridge University, they had these things about first wrangler, second wrangler, who did the best in this, uh, you know, exam of, of mathematics. And story goes that uh, he sent his servant on the day that they posted the results uh, and when the servant to, to see the, the list. And when the servant came back, he asked him, so who was second wrangler, assuming that he was first? And his um, servant said, well, you, sir, uh, because it turned out he actually came in second. Um, he also got, however, the Smith Prize later, which uh, was pr probably even harder to get, and uh, no doubt a, a, a genius of, of great caliber. Um, not only a genius, but also a person, you know, of the type that we don't see that much today anymore. Uh, he was both great as a theorist and an, as, a, as an experimentalist. I mean, he even had in him, uh, you know, an engineering knowledge, which was enormous. Um, uh, and he invented various things. Uh, uh, this thing happens to be the telegraphic siphon recorder, which he invented, which was used to, uh, to get telegraphic communication with submarines. It, it was doing with ink, you know, on wiggles on a paper, uh, which, which then was read by, by people who were uh, conversant with, you know, Morse code and things like that. Um, so he, he really put his knowledge of mathematics and physics to also to great um, use um, in, you know, he was involved in uh, putting the, the cable under ocean cable, uh, between the continents and so on. He, th that's another machine of his inventions, which was uh, a tide prediction machine um, th that he invented. Um, and he also had a mariner's compass, um, which was this, which was supposed to um, correct for metal existing in the ships themselves. Uh, by the way, as almost with, with anything related to uh, Lord Kelvin, um, there are some controversies. I mean, you know, if you, if you ask what physicists thinks about this mariner's compass, they think that his contribution was enormous. If you ask the Navy, uh, they say, oh, well, he really didn't do that much, but he just wanted to take credit for this and so on. The truth is always somewhere in the middle. Uh, between these types of things. But uh, the, the reason I, I, I bring this up is because he was really a very, very, uh, not just smart and knowledgeable, but had this incredible talent of dealing with, with uh, practical problems as well. Now, the topic I want to talk to you about today um, is not that, but he's calculation of the age of the earth. Uh, and uh, the problem with the age of the earth is that, you know, for many years, uh, age of the earth was uh, always taken from, uh, you know, uh, the Bible and things like that. Uh, people were basically counting the, you know, the <laughs> ages of people uh, as listed in the Bible and adding them up and coming with numbers, you know, that were always, you know, like 6,000 years, uh, numbers like that. And that, that happened for a long period of time. Um, only much later, uh, people started, you know, thinking of, you know, is there some physical way of, of estimating the age uh, of the earth? And uh, Lord Kelvin uh, decided at one point to, to do this. And uh, as you will see, uh, what he did was extraordinarily uh, clever, actually. Um, and, and this followed 
a, a number of people who tried to, to do things related to the level of the sea and things like that, we, all, all of which gave uh, values that were not uh, particularly um, good. I mean, uh, Buffon was, uh, you know, this French uh, scientist, he actually did a very interesting uh, problem with, with cooling spheres and so on. And, but, but he also came up only with a few tens of thousands of years or things like that. But then Kelvin started noticing that the geologists were, um, you know, at that time they developed this theory, which was the uniformitarianism, which uh, basically assumed uh, almost that uh, there was no age, you know, that the earth never changed. And, uh, you know, it had an infinite age at, at some level, that the earth now looked the same as it has ever looked. Uh, and uh, this uh, involved uh, very, very famous people like Lyle and others, geologists, who um, came up with these incredibly long periods uh, for the age of the earth, or as I say, you know, almost even infinite. And that was good at some level because, you know, Darwin also came up with this theory of evolution and um, his theory of evolution by its very nature uh, required very long periods of time. So the geologists and some biologists, you know, were kind of in sync uh, in terms of what they thought. But uh, Kelvin then sat one day and heard about a, a, a geologist talk about uh, age of uh, certain areas in Scotland. And uh, uh, also Scottish geologist uh, Andrew Ramsey was there. And uh, Kelvin describes how uh, he asked, uh, you know, Ramsey, uh, how long a time he allowed for that geological history. And Ramsey said that he could suggest no limit to it. And then Kelvin insisted, he said, what, uh, five billion years? He said, sure, why not? He said, 10 billion years? He said, yeah, why not? Uh, he says, well, you know, maybe a, a million, million years, you know, so, uh, and, and Ramsey said, I, I can put no limit on this. And uh, Kelvin said, but, but how can you say that? I mean, you know, if you look at something like the sun, uh, the sun is a ball of gas and uh, we actually know its mass and, you know, it can have heat for this long, but then it will run out of it. Uh, can't you use some thermodynamics and so on? And uh, Ramsey actually said that uh, he couldn't understand this thing no more than physicists could understand the reasons of geologists. And Kelvin got very annoyed by this and said, you, you definitely could understand this if you put your mind to it. So he then said, he set out to, to, to try to calculate the age of the earth. And, you know, think about this. I mean, calculating the age of the earth is, was a phenomenal job. And the way Kelvin started thinking about this, it was, was the following. I, I'll give you a simple example, which will demonstrate what I'm talking about. And actually, you see this, you know, every day on TV in forensics, where you know, from the temperature of the body, they can tell when somebody was murdered and things like that. Um, but imagine, you know, that uh, you want to do a turkey, and uh, okay, you put the turkey in the oven and you you prepare it, and once you know it's ready in the oven, you take it and straight into the freezer. You put it straight into the freezer. Now, what's going to happen? The turkey had a certain, basically uniform temperature coming out of the oven. But now as you put it into the freezer, the skin, you know, starts to get the temperature of the freezer. And the longer you will hold that turkey in the freezer, that cold temperature from the freezer will start penetrating into the turkey. And so that the depth of the skin between the cold temperature and the freezer and the initial temperature of the turkey is gonna increase, the depth will increase. And as that depth will increase, 
it means that the gradient of the temperature, namely the rate at which the temperature changes from the temperature of the initial turkey and to the freezer, the, that thing will become shallower and shallower because at the beginning, there was a huge temperature difference across a very thin skin. And then th this was a huge drop. And then, you know, as the skin became wider and wider, thicker and thicker, then the same drop now occurred over a much longer distance. So the gradient basically became shallower. So this is what this was the idea that Kelvin had. Basically, he knew that if you dig into the earth at various places, you can see that it is hotter inside then you know on the outside and in fact the deeper you dig the hotter it becomes so his assumption was that the earth was created hot and molten and that you know it is continuously losing its heat and becoming cooler and as a result of this the depth of the crust if you want or the skin uh, you know increases all the time uh, because you know it's cooler on the outside and so that progresses inwards until the point where it's still the original hot temperature of uh, of the earth and by determining these things he thought he could determine the age of the earth so for this he needed a few things he needed to know what was the initial temperature of the earth he needed to know how the temperature changes with depth inside the earth and he needed to know the conductivity how he, he assumed that heat is being lost by conduction in the same way that you know you put a skillet i don't know on the fire and the heat is transported to the handle of that skillet so uh, by conduction so he needed to know the conduction of this earth material or this rock material now again in a typical kelvin um, thoroughness he, he he went into finding these things now he could not find the temperature of the initial earth that you know that even though that is remains there very deep inside the earth there was no way to measure that so he assumed that that is a temperature of molten rock which he took to be something of the order of 7000 fahrenheit and so on it turns out that was not a bad number overall. Uh, in terms of the how the temperature changes with depth, he actually did experiments. He looked at the various places where they dug into the earth and measured. And, and then he took, there were some differences from place to place, but he took some sort of an average and he got uh, something like, um, you know, that for every, 50 feet or so, there was a, a uh, an, an increase as you go inward by one degree Fahrenheit or things like that. And uh, for the conduction, he also did experiments with various rocks, sands, and so on. Doing all of that, he got an age for the Earth of about 100 million years. Uh, so this was an enormous achievement in itself, you know, that he got the actual age of the Earth from doing these experiments and, and using the theory of conduction of heat. The problem was that 100 million years was far too short for Darwin's theory of evolution and did not agree at all with what the geologists thought. And in fact, when he you know, refined his calculations somewhat and repeated them and so on. He assumed, by the way, that the conduction is the same throughout. Um, he even got somewhat lower number than that. Uh, but he allowed for uncertainties and actually said that it is between a few tens of millions of years and 400 million years. Now, the problem is that we know now, yes, and we already knew for a while, the age of the earth is 4.5 billion years. So Kelvin's estimate, which supposedly was based on physics, was off by a factor of 50. 
How is that possible? Well, the person who uh, came up with a solution was this person, John Perry, who actually, believe it or not, was at some point an assistant in Kelvin's lab for a year and also studied with Kelvin's brother. And uh, Perry's motivation probably had to do with Darwin's theory of evolution because he saw how Kelvin now was using his age of the earth to, uh, you know, to say that you know, Darwin's theory of evolution couldn't work. Um, so Perry started thinking what could change here? And eventually he came up with a following idea. He said, well, the interior of the earth actually may be somewhat fluid. And so heat can be transported by convection, not by conduction, namely by motion of fluid. And thereby you can keep the interior hotter for a longer period of time so that the skin will be you know, somewhat thinner than what Kelvin thought. Um, and by doing that, he actually obtained that the age of the earth could be as much as two billion years or you know, you know, maybe even a little bit larger. Now, here is a point. Perry could not prove that this is the situation and he didn't mean to prove. All he meant to show is that Kelvin could be wrong in his assessment. And you know, there was a big controversy between him and Kelvin about this. And Kelvin to the end did not actually accept this. Now you will see some books that will tell you that the reason that Kelvin made the mistake is because he didn't know about radioactivity. And it is true that Kelvin did not know about radioactivity, but that was not the reason for his mistake because with his heat transfer by conduction, he actually couldn't mine the energy from radioactivity from a very deep layer. And that would have made a very small, therefore, uh, change in his estimate. His real mistake had to do because he neglected the possibility of convection. Now, at old age, Kelvin objected to many things. He even objected to Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism. And he you know, turned out to be some, somewhat of an obstructionist to various things. And actually this is why uh, his fame is greatly reduced. You see, when, when he died, he was buried alongside Isaac Newton um, because he, you know, he was thought so, so big, but uh, today, nobody thinks of him as one of the giants uh, of science. Uh, why did he make that blunder? Well, we will never really know, but there are many psychological studies which show that, you know, even adults, not people like Kelvin, once they formed an opinion, it is extremely hard to change that opinion, even if presented with contradictory facts. Um, in Kelvin's case, you know, he had a lifetime in which he constructed his opinions. So for him to change his mind was, you know, would have resulted in a very, very serious cognitive dissonance. And so we have to assume that, you know, that's what, what it was with him. He was still a great scientist, but he couldn't except the fact that he even could be wrong. The next person that I want to describe is Fred Hoyle. Fred Hoyle is undoubtedly one of the greatest astrophysicists of the 20th century. Um, he, you know, he is the, the theorist behind uh, the theory of how elements were formed in stars, what we call nucleosynthesis. Uh, and here he is, you know, teaching some of that. Uh, basically, he developed the theoretical framework which said how nu through nuclear reactions, all the elements that we know and love were formed uh, inside stars. And uh, he also 
you know, did a lot for it. Uh, stellar evolution and, and all that. Um, you know, the famous paper that he did on nucleosynthesis was done with these people here. Here is Hoyle on the right. In the middle is Willie Fowler. Uh, this is at his 60th birthday. And the Burbages are uh, on the left. And uh, basically Fowler was always very fond of trains and to, for his 60th birthday, his friends bought him this locomotive and made him uh, very happy. Now, this uh, quartet here uh, were responsible for this famous paper, Synthesis of the Elements in Stars, uh, which has really, um, it, it is one of the foundations of astrophysics and cosmology. Um, you, you know, it's, it's hard to, to, to say something, you, you know, there was hardly a paper that uh, was, you know, more influential uh, than this. Uh, by the way, Willie Fowler got the Nobel Prize and Fred did not. Uh, many people thought, uh, the Burbages especially, that uh, Fred deserved it uh, certainly as much as Fowler. But uh, Fred was, uh, you know, expressing all kinds of controversial views on many other things and also criticizing the Nobel Committee. Um, and uh, uh, as a result, uh, he probably didn't get it. But, uh, you know, he was, uh, he really was a genius in, in many ways. Now, the topic that I want to talk about is um, this, the business of the steady state model that he's responsible for and his objections to the Big Bang model. And here he explains uh, his objection. I don't believe in the Big Bang because there has been a theory rather well worked out of how the Big Bang is supposed to have happened. And it seems to me that it is not uh, likely to be correct. So I, I, there are too many, too many assumptions in it for me to like it. And it's just too, too far removed from astronomical observation. Uh, quite obviously, we can't um, observe what happened um, 10,000 million years ago. Whereas uh, we can observe what happens in the center of a galaxy today. And so I prefer always to choose the alternative that allows one to carry out observations now. I don't like the idea that uh, something is dependent on, on uh, a cause that I can never verify. So I don't like this because it's in the past. It's all over and done with. I can't, uh, can't get at it, as it were. So I, I, I tend to avoid it. I don't like it. So, uh you know that uh, Fred Hoyle actually is the person who coined the term Big Bang during a radio program. Um, some people say that, you know, this was in a derogatory fashion. He actually didn't see it as such. He just wanted to give the impression that it all happened in one go. So he said, so this is all a Big Bang. Um, uh, but anyhow, as he just pointed out, he didn't like it. And he came up together with these two gentlemen here. Um, he's on the right here, uh, Herman Bondi is in the middle and Tommy Gold uh, on the left. And these three people came up with what became known as the steady state theory. And uh, what is the steady state compared to the Big Bang? Basically, in the Big Bang, uh, you know, if you look at, uh, let's say, galaxies, these points could represent galaxies and the universe is expanding, they actually knew about the fact that the universe was expanding. They were fully aware of this. Um, in the normal Big Bang, I mean, basically the density of matter is falling all the time because uh, the universe is expanding. And so uh, the density of matter falls and the universe cools down and so on. In the steady state, basically they wanted things not to change, to remain the same. Now for that to happen, 
while the universe is expanding, you actually uh, needed to create new matter in the universe as in the bottom figure here, where you create new matter so that the density stays the same all the time. And in fact, nothing changes. Now, the idea, I will tell you, the idea was just genius because we already had, and even from Einstein, we, we knew that there was an assumption that the universe was homogeneous and isotropic, which meant the same everywhere and in every direction in space. What they suggested that the universe was also the same in time, that the universe was unchanging. So this was a very clever idea uh, initially. Now, you know, you may ask, um, yeah, but you have to create matter, you know, new matter. This sounds crazy. Well, Fred Hoyle pointed out, listen, in the Big Bang, you want to create all the matter at once. Uh, here I'm creating it slowly by slowly. This was very slowly what he required. I mean, he basically required something like a new atom appearing um, every hundred years in a volume like uh, the Empire State Building. This was the rate at which new matter was created. So he basically added to Einstein's equations another sort of creation term which created matter to keep matter in a steady state. That, that was um, his idea. Um, now, he, <laughs> believe it or not, the idea uh, they say uh, about this steady state came to them from a certain horror film, which the three of them went to see in Cambridge, which was called Dead of Night. This is the poster for that film where these were ghost stories. There were like four ghost stories. And there were three ghost stories that were kind of appeared to be unrelated. But then the fourth story somehow connected to the first one so that you could start all over again. And that kind of gave them the idea. Uh, basically, Tommy Gold said, well, maybe the universe is like that too, that you know, you always cycle back and uh, you know you you never really uh, change so this was uh, the idea uh, behind the steady state model and for about 15 years or so uh, that idea was um, a genuine contender to the to the big bang um, but then you know uh, all kinds of evidence started appearing uh, that showed that actually, no, the universe was not unchanging. Uh, I mean, it started with uh, quasars. These are these active galaxies that, uh, you know, there were more of them in the past than, than in the present. Uh, today, there are, you know, a, a good number of evidences that the universe started from a hot, dense state. And, you know, it is expanding from that. I mean, it has to do with nucleosynthesis, but nucleosynthesis in general, in, in the universe at large, not just inside stars. Uh, it has to do with the cosmic microwave background, uh, which you know now has been measured uh, very accurately by the Planck uh, uh, satellite, and before that, WMAP, and so on. And all of these uh, appear to be very, very consistent with the idea of a Big Bang. Now. Let me just emphasize, the blunder that Fred made was not by thinking of the steady state model. Thinking of the state, steady state model was genius. The blunder was that even as data were accumulating, contradicting the idea of a steady state, he continued to believe in the steady state model. Uh, you know, he used to say things are the way they are because they were the, as they were. Um, and, and he, as he pointed out, you know, in that short interview, he was till the very end against the idea of the Big Bang. Even though, by the way, he contributed some elements that added to that theory of, of the Big Bang, but he was, 
all the time against it. Uh, largely, perhaps other than the fact that, you know, he suggested the steady state model. Uh, again, it had to do, believe it or not, with life too. Um, he couldn't believe that in a universe with the finite age that was being talked about at the time, uh, life could emerge. Uh, he thought that the universe must be much, much older than that. In fact, to the point that it had no age, that it has, um, you, you know, in a steady state. Um, even though uh, the suggestions he made, you know, panspermia and I don't know what, uh, only increased the age of the universe by maybe a factor of two uh, or thereabouts. But he basically did not believe that you could uh, make um, life uh, in, in the time that was available. And also he had other reasons that had to do with, uh, he sort of calculated that if uh, you formed all the helium in the universe uh, in stars, then you could actually get to something like the temperature of the microwave background and, and things like that. And he refused to believe it till the very end. Now, I, I wondered a lot, I must say, when, when I was writing the book, um, why a person as smart as he was, you know, stuck with this wrong idea in spite of all the evidence that was accumulating. And to understand that a little bit, I um, also interviewed a few of his students at the time. Um, I also interviewed uh, Lord Martin Rees, who was with him at, at, at that uh, time, you know, and so on. And I, I got certain answers. They were not all the same, but uh, let me give you a flavor of the thing. Uh, one of the things apparently was that during that entire time, Fred Hoyle was interacting very little, even with the astrophysicists and cosmologists in his department. He was mainly talking just to the few people who were his direct collaborators and who supported everything he said. Um, and that is, clearly not a good practice. I mean, you know, you have, there were very young, smart people in that department and he somehow never talked to them. He only talked to the people who supported him. And, you know, he had people like Jan Nardikar, he had people like uh, Wikrama Singh and, and who worked with him and, and, and supported his ideas. And, um, Somehow he, he, he didn't talk to others. The other thing was that even he himself wrote several times that um, descent is very important in physics. He, he really valued descent. I mean, you know, not going with the mainstream. I mean, you know, if the mainstream thinks one thing, he made an effort to think differently. Um, and, and that was another thing. And that works sometimes and, you know, leads to great achievements, but sometimes you know, it just turns out to be wrong because the mainstream is most of the time correct. Occasionally you have a Galileo uh, about whom I wrote a book who, you know, is, uh, goes against the mainstream and turns out to be right. Uh, but most of the time that's not the case. Um, so that that's, uh, the story of Fred Hoyle. And uh, the last person needs no introduction. That's uh, Albert Einstein. And uh, this is one of my favorite pictures of Einstein. Uh, you see, my hair now is short. Uh, in this pandemic, you know, we cut our hair ourselves. Uh, but when my hair gets longer, it, it looks very much like this. Uh, and I, I, I like to say that that's not the only similarity. I, I, I like to say that Newton is dead, Einstein is dead, and I also don't feel so well. Um, so in any case, uh, Einstein, of course, uh, needs no introduction, and I don't need to tell you what a genius he was. Uh, and I want, again, to concentrate just on one thing, and, 
this has to do with this theory of uh, general relativity. Uh, now, some of you uh, may be a little bit rusty on your general relativity. So I, I will just in a few words explain to you what is meant here. Let's for a second, forget about the second term on the right-hand side of this equation and just look at the, at the first term. So uh, on the left side of the equation is something that describes basically the geometry of space. And on the right side, again, the first term describes the contents of uh, energy and momentum that is in space. And that number G that appears there is the strength of gravity. So basically what this equation is telling us is that the energy in space uh, determines the geometry of space. Uh, and that the strength of gravity that we see is basically just a, a, a manifestation of how space is warped. So basically, you know, there is an example that people like to give it. If I stand on a trampoline, I uh, can warp the trampoline. And then if I will throw small balls onto that, they try to find the shortest path in that curved space. And uh, that is Einstein's idea of what gravity is. Namely, gravity is not some mysterious force that acts across distance. Gravity describes the curvature of space. Namely, masses curve space around them, like the sun curves space around it. And the planets then find the shortest paths in this curved space. And that's what gravity is all about. In other words, um, mass and energy tell space how to curve and the space tells mass how to move. So this was basic, the basics of Einstein's uh, general relativity. Uh, but as soon as he wrote this, he then, uh, two years later, tried to apply it to the universe at large. And uh, when he tried to apply it to the universe at large, at that point, um, galaxies other than the Milky Way were not yet known, uh, but he knew about stars. And he thought that aesthetically, it was good that the universe will be in equilibrium, that nothing moves. But he understood that this was a bit strange because if everything attracts everything else, how can it not move? I mean, these things would just collapse on itself uh, through the gravity. So because he liked this idea of things in equilibrium, he added the second term on the right-hand side of this equation, which basically at every point if the force was such that it was attracting something in this direction, he added a fudge factor, if you like, which pushed it in that direction so as to keep it in equilibrium. And he was very happy about this. It turns out it was not actually the greatest solution to this problem because this equilibrium was unstable. It was a bit like you know, trying to balance, uh, I don't know, your pen on your finger and the slightest movement you know, makes it fall. Um, but in any case, it was an equilibrium and he, he was very happy with it. But then something happened. And what happened was this, these two gentlemen, um, this uh, cosmologist and priest, uh, Georges Lemaitre, who is uh, up here, and uh, Edwin Hubble um, basically discovered that our universe is not static, it is expanding. Uh, this was in the 1920s. And once Einstein heard that the universe is actually expanding, he said, oh, wait a second. If it's expanding, I don't need to put it like this in equilibrium because what's going to happen is that the gravity will just slow down the expansion in the same way that, you know, I take something, throw it up here, the gravity of the Earth slows it down. Um, so... Basically, he decided that he doesn't need that second term from his equation, and he decided to take it out of the equation. 
Now, there is a whole story about him saying that that was the biggest blunder he made in his life, putting that term in. Uh, I, I did a lot of research whether he said that or not. And in my opinion, he never actually used that phrase, uh, the biggest blunder. But that doesn't matter. He definitely thought it was a mistake to put that term in once he discovered that the universe is expanding. And he therefore took it out of his equation. But then you know what happened. Uh, in 1998, two teams of astronomers working independently discovered that not only is our universe expanding, the expansion is not slowing down. It's speeding up as if something is pushing on it to actually speed up the expansion. And the way they did this observation was originally it was by looking at very distant supernova explosions, exploding stars that you can see very far away and you know, determine this way how the distance changes and so on. Um, so the universe is speeding up, accelerating. Since then we have even more evidence from the microwave background and so on that the expansion of the universe is accelerating. So what is it that's pushing the universe to accelerate? Uh, you, you know, this is crazy. I mean, it's like me again now throwing something up and instead of slowing down and coming back, it actually starts accelerating towards the sea. I, I once gave a talk at a place and there was a seven-year-old kid who was sitting in the front row. And I say, what you, would you have thought if I threw my keys up and it started accelerating towards the ceiling and the kids said, magic. Uh, so it really looks like magic. Well, believe it or not, as far as we can tell now, the thing that causes this cosmic expansion to accelerate is that second term that Einstein took out of his equation. I and mean, some people, are so smart that even when they make a blunder that turns out to be an insight. Namely, if Einstein made a blunder at all, it was not by putting that term into his equation, it was by taking it out. Had he actually kept it in, he might have predicted that we will discover that the expansion of the universe is accelerating. So, that's the situation uh, for the moment. And this finishes what I had to say of my three scientists. But I want now to go back to the question in general of uh, blunders in general. You see, very often what we read about in news media, even in textbooks, what we're taught in school, it looks like progress in science is sort of a direct march from A to B. Anybody who was ever involved in scientific research knows that nothing can be further from the truth. Progress in science looks something more like this. It's a zigzag path with many false starts, many blind alleys, many situations where you need to go back to the point where you started. Namely, progress in science involves blunders too. Not only that, we always want to encourage, you know, when we teach, when we educate, you know, thinking outside the box. Well, guess what? When you think outside the box, you sometimes make a blunder. Now, I'm not saying that you should think all the time outside the box. There is a lot to be said for incremental progress in science. And it happens all the time. But occasionally, in order to get something really new, you need to think outside the box. I mean, mathematically speaking, you know, if you are stuck in some minimum here and you want to get out of this, uh, if you do an infinitesimal change, it will not get you out. You need 
what in mathematics is called a finite amplitude perturbation to get you out. So you need sometimes to do these things. In other words, blunders are part and parcel of progress in science. Now, I want to emphasize, I called my book Brilliant Blunders. Namely, I'm not advocating blunders. I'm not advocating blunders that are being done because you're being sloppy, not because you're being uninformed. I mean, sloppy is not good. If you are not thoughtful enough, it's not good. And even if you are uninformed, you, you should ask for guidance. So those are not allowed. Brilliant blunders, I mean, are those that when you try to think a little bit differently, but in a way that is still consistent with, you know, the area in which you're thinking about, in this case, let's say physics, yes? But in an unusual or, you know, non-conventional way. Those are the things that, you know, are the brilliant blunders. And those are the things that I am trying to advocate. I mean, it used to be, for example, you know, when you do um, proposals, you know, proposals for certain scientific experiments and so on and so forth. I think that it is a good idea always to allocate a certain amount of funding or time to proposals that are thoughtful, even though risky. I'm not saying you should devote all your budget to that, but you know, maybe 10% or something to things that are risky, but with the potential for an important result. So basically, uh, let me finish by saying that blunders in science, and I'm talking about this brilliant blunders can actually be portals to important discoveries. Thank you very much. And I'll be happy to try to answer questions if you have any. So I'll escape from my presentation and try to go to, to the chat box, to the Q&A box, sorry, and see what you have there. So I see a few questions here. Um, Steve asks, please give some definition to your use of the term blunder. How is it different from the natural evolution of physics and science principle based upon increased knowledge from advancing theory, experiments, modeling, and data integrate interpretation? Uh, did these physics grades really make mistakes? So, I think I explained that. Um, yes, they did make mistakes, but they made mistakes of the type that I refer to as brilliant. So they did follow the general scientific method, let's call it that for lack of a better word. Uh, but, you know, for example, in the case of Hoyle or, or Kelvin, the fact that they didn't want to change their mind. Uh, was in some sense unphysical. Um, some, here is somebody named, I believe, Philip, who says, I've heard that part of Hoyle's objection to the Big Bang had to do with his firm atheism, that he found the Big Bang too close to the biblical account uh, of creation ex nihilo. Uh, I also understand that looking at the apparent fine tuning of the universe, that he said that it seemed like a put up job, even though he objected to the idea of a creator. Would you comment? Um, it is true that uh, Fred Hoyle um, probably did not like the idea of a, a creation ex nihilo. Um, I, I think that is true. Um, but I think that his main objection still came from the idea of, um, you know, wanting to accommodate uh, Darwin's theory of evolution and so on. Um, 
then somebody else here asks, um, of all the blunders you have covered this evening, which do you think is the biggest? And if you could include one more, uh, what would that be? Uh, I, I don't know that I can rank those blunders uh, by, uh, by their size. Um, and uh, actually, as I pointed out in the book, I do mention a major blunder made by Charles Darwin uh, and a major blunder made by Linus Pauling. So those give examples of other things. Um, then uh, Ashley asks, uh, to blunder is human. Can you envisage a scientific mechanism to overcome this human failing? Um, I'm not sure I even want to overcome, as I pointed out, I don't want to overcome this failing in the case of these things I call brilliant blunders. Uh, I definitely think that we shouldn't um, do those blunders that come as a result of um, being sloppy and so on. Um, okay, uh, then somebody here asks if uh, radioactivity is required to get the age of the of the earth correct and then and the answer there is absolutely yes i mean um, that we know the age of the earth because of radioactive dating that's how we know it very very uh, accurately uh, then eugene here says that he is confused um, because he, if Einstein put the second term to prevent the universe from collapsing, the taking it out should result in the equation that predicting the universe is collapsing. Well, no, because if the universe is expanding, it is not collapsing. It is just slowing down uh, under uh, gravity. Um, what was your most frustrating blunder in your own line of work? <laughs> uh, I, I wouldn't pretend to have made um, any discovery that uh, comes even close to the <laughs> discoveries of the people I have described. Um, if I try to think, uh, I do have a story that is uh, kind of interesting uh, about uh, something like that, which is the following. When I was a grad student, um, a certain astronomer, uh, there are these objects called planetary nebulae. Uh, planetary nebulae describe a, a stage late in the life of stars. Our own sun is going to do that. Uh, when the sun consumes its nuclear fuel, the core of, will, will uh, start shrinking and the envelope will expand. The star becomes a red giant and eventually ejects its envelope. And as it irradiates that envelope, that is what we call a planetary nebula. Um, and for a long time, for the longest time, people thought that single stars do that. Uh, and then a certain astronomer claimed that six planetary nebulae that were observed actually contain binary systems at the center, two stars that revolve one around the other and not single stars. And I was very intrigued by that as a graduate student. And I actually developed a theory that explained how with the binary system, you actually get this ejection and you shape this nebulae and so on. Uh, and I was very, very happy with that. And then other astronomers observed those same six objects that the first astronomer observed. And they showed that actually none of those appeared to be a binary system. So here I was with an interesting theory of how you do this planetary nebulae with binary stars, but for something that maybe doesn't even exist. Well, believe it or not, later people started observing planetary nebulae more carefully, especially their central stars. And they found that most of them have binary stars at the center. And actually, the theory that I developed works quite well for all those 
uh, objects. So there was this situation where I developed a theory for something that maybe doesn't exist, which turned out to exist. Oddly enough, those first six objects are still thought to be only single stars. So the first six that were suggested, that actually inspired the whole set of observations that showed the importance of these binaries. Anyhow, uh, let me see, there are some more. Uh, there are quite a few questions here and I will not be able to read all of them, but let me continue. Uh, are some people inherently destined to narrow their minds as they age? Uh, aren't we all? Uh, or are there other factors at work? Being of certain age, I think, still have an open mind, but sadly, too many of my contemporaries are getting fossilized in their outlook and their ability to think and take on new knowledge. Um, this is a serious problem. And let me point out uh, something which I didn't say in my talk, uh, which uh, was given to me as one possible explanation to uh, Fred Hoyle's uh, state of mind uh, later in life. Um, and this turns out to be true for many scientists. There are many scientists uh, who are very good scientists and made very important work. And then at old age, um, they feel that they, uh, I don't want to say bored, but they feel as, as if it's not exciting enough for them to go on working in the same area in which they spent all their scientific career. And they then start to go into something that's a little bit outside their area and attempt to make a important contribution in that area. And that sometimes turns out to be a disaster. Uh, I'll give you an example, for example, Linus Pauling, whom I dis actually discuss in the book, and uh, the, the, the blunder I discuss in the book has to do with his model for, uh, for DNA. But some of you may know that late in life, he decided to start to say that vitamin C is the cure for everything, you know, and so on. Things that had nothing to do with his usual work uh, and, and so on. So you see this tendency of people sometimes to go into completely new areas and they think that because they made important contributions in one area, they will be able to make in the other. And often that turns out not to be the case, unfortunately. Um, okay, um, Ada has, a, are accomplished scientists afraid nowadays of blunders or is it accepted as the route to innovation? Does the fear of loss of credibility put a stop uh, to thinking outside the box and risking to explore ideas that uh, deviate from uh, what we expect. Yeah, so um, indeed, uh, I would say that the way, it, it, it's, not a, it, it's not an accident that I mention how one funds um, proposals because there is a tendency to only give money to proposals that suggest very incremental uh, advances, namely to suggest things where you actually probably know the answer already in advance um, because there is this fear that otherwise you will not get funded. And this is why I say that I would recommend that every proposal process should allocate a certain amount of funding to riskier proposals. Uh, the same is true, by the way, for tests, for example, at schools. Um, I, I, I must admit that I, I don't know how exactly it works in the UK, but for example, in the US, uh, most tests at the university even are uh, multiple choice. Uh, and, and there is a lot to be said for multiple choice tests, uh, especially because they are much easier to grade. You can give more of them and 
as a result, the final grade does not depend on how you happen to have done in one particular test when you know maybe you didn't feel so well or whatever uh, that particular day. So, so there is something very positive about multiple choice tests. On the other hand, there is also something bad about them in the sense that your answer is either right or wrong. I mean, you get no points if you know you actually did everything right, but at the end, you know, you made some small mistake, whatever, and as a result, you got the, the wrong answer. So again, I recommend that tests can be by and large multiple choice, but every now and then you should test in a different way, you know, maybe oral tests or or you know, or tests where people actually expand on what they think and the thought process and so on. Um, Okay, somebody here tells me that Jodra Bank made a brilliant blunder by publishing a paper in Nature stating that it had found the first extrasolar planet. Yes, uh, that is actually true. And, and he talks about uh, Wal Alex Volshan and Frail. Um, it, it's a, it's a, it was a beautiful, actually, story uh, with, with Andrew Lyne. Um, there was a blunder there. Uh, the blunder actually, in that case, I, I, I wouldn't, it was not a brilliant blunder. It was somewhat of a sloppy blunder. However, the beautiful part of that was that the blunderer stood up bravely and not only admitted the blunder, but actually explained in detail how the blunder occurred. And he actually got a standing ovation from a crowd of astronomers, you know, listening to that talk. And it is true that Alex Volchan and Dale Frail were inspired by that particular observation and discovered the first planets around the pulsar. Um, the first planets that extrasolar planets that were discovered were not around sun-like stars. They were around a pulsar. And, um, and the first announcement of such a discovery was wrong, turned out to be a blunder. The second announcement, however, turned out to be right. And since then, they have discovered a few more. Actually, strangely, not many more, very few, few more, and I actually published a paper a few years ago about why that is, why there are so few pulsar planets, but that's a different issue. So I agree that the blunder in this case uh, inspired others to, to do the work right and, and get the, the result. Um, are there any current physics discoveries? Uh, this is Alisa asking, uh, that many scientists believe which you think could become more brilliant blunders in the future. Um, it's, it's hard to know, but uh, look, uh, let me give one example of something that uh, I'm sure all of you heard of string theory and so on. String theory about 20 years ago was absolutely thought to be our best candidate for a unified theory uh, which unifies uh, the physics on the subatomic scale, namely quantum mechanics, uh, with the physics on the largest scale, namely general relativity. Um, it still perhaps is our best candidate uh, for such a theory. However, a few decades have passed and um, string theory has been so far unable to produce any really testable predictions. And as a result, uh, many people now have lost faith in that. And um, it is very possible that it will turn out to be the wrong path to have taken in the first place. Um, so, you know, it could turn out to be a brilliant blunder. Why is it still brilliant? I'll tell you, because first of all, the idea was brilliant. And second, the development of string theory has led to so many important mathematical developments that 
I have no doubt that those will prove in whatever theory we will eventually have. So it may prove to be a brilliant blunder, although we don't know that yet. Uh, Stuart asks me, do you recommend more publications of our blunders or negative results uh, like Kepler, for example? Um, yes, um, actually Linus Pauling, whom I did not discuss today, told one of his postdocs that if you have something that you regard as a, an important idea, uh, you should always publish it because he said, you know, if, you, if it's a mistake, there will always be smart people who will find out that it is a mistake. If on the other hand, it is really important and you just didn't publish it because you were afraid to publish a speculative idea, science will lose as a result of that. So, um, so yes, I would say, again, <laughs> publish brilliant matters. <laughs> of course, you don't know in advance always what was brilliant and what not. But you do know if something was a result of sloppy work or uninformed work or not thoughtful enough work. So those uh, you should definitely uh, publish. Uh, Brad asks me, says, Ed Catmull uh, of Pixar writes of the role failure plays in the creative process. Do you have any insights into similarities and difference between brilliant, artistic, and scientific blunders. Yes, th this is an important point because, of course, I discuss science and physics in particular, but uh, almost everything I said uh, should actually apply to other areas as well. And actually, at IBM, uh, there used to be uh, this philosophy where you know people should definitely um, you know, think outside the mainstream, even if uh, that leads uh, occasionally to, to various mistakes. Uh, and so that uh, is, is a good practice, I believe. I see no more questions at this point. So I think that, uh, okay, there is another question by Ambika. If Fred Hoyle's brander was because of his negligence, a non-acceptance of new research. Why do you still call his blunder brilliant? Um, yeah, well, it wasn't because of negligence so much. It was because it, it's true that you, it was because of non-acceptance, but it was brilliant because the idea was absolutely brilliant. And actually it could have been right. I mean, in, in terms of just pure aesthetics, I would say, that the steady state perhaps is, you know, even more beautiful than, uh, than the Big Bang. So, uh, so I, I still think it was a brilliant idea. Um, okay, are there any, at the moment there are no further questions. So uh, Joe, I don't know. Oh, there is another one. Um, was it a blunder for Jocelyn Bell Burnell to be denied the Nobel Prize? Well, I think that that was a blunder, but that was not a brilliant blunder at all. Uh, I, I, I definitely think, and actually Fred Hoyle criticized that very, very much. And maybe this is partly why he never got uh, the Nobel Prize. Um, the, the Nobel Prize committee has since um, somewhat corrected its ways and in cases in which uh, you know the young, uh, younger students or scientists were involved, they did actually give uh, the prize to both uh, people uh, and so on. And hopefully this will continue to happen uh, in the future. I, I definitely believe uh, that that was a mistake not to give her as it was a mistake not to give to Fred Hoyle uh, the Nobel Prize. Dr. Olivier, thank you so much. Um, that was a, a great place to end up. Um, I'm Carol Sutter. I'm the uh, Master of St. Cross College, which hosts the HAP uh, Centre. And I 
am not a physicist, so I have a wonderful series of evenings when I concentrate very hard and learn a great deal, as I have certainly this evening. And I think one of the wonderful ways you bookended uh, your, your discussion was starting with um, encouraging us all because we do all make blunders from time to time, but then reminding us very firmly that they have to be brilliant blunders and not sloppy or uneducated or ill thought through blunders. I have to say I'm also delighted to see that physicists uh, no longer require the beards and whiskers that seem to be absolutely de rigueur for the 19th century um, physicists that, uh, that we've all seen the wonderful photographs and pictures of. Um, I think this evening you've really um, given us a tremendous example of how looking back and understanding um, the way in which ideas have developed helps us to have confidence in, in the work that uh, people do for the future. So um, being prepared to accept that uh, things change, our understanding change, our knowledge changes, is crucial to all of those, um, I'm sure many watching in academia who are attempting to develop their, their thoughts and their research. I was particularly struck by your encouragement to um, funders and to funding applications to go for the risky and not always to stick to the next most obvious thing. Um, I'm sure that the brilliant blunders um, might fall into that category, but general brilliance will often come out of that category as well, which was fantastic. Um, I think that Perhaps that very final point that you ended up on um, with, if you like, the more senior partner in a team being recognised, whether it's for the Nobel Prizes or anything else, alongside the more junior members of their team, perhaps would be a little bit of the counterweight to that tendency that some of us may have of getting a little bit more fixed in our views as we get a bit older. So perhaps that's the answer to one of those problems that, that a number of people um, raised. So could I just um, bring this to an end by thanking you so much, Dr. Libio, for an absolutely fantastic talk for um, to Dr. Joe Ashbourne, who, uh, as always, has pulled this together in a remarkable way, to our colleagues at the Department of Physics who provide us with all the technical backup and make sure that we managed to speak to this evening well over 500 people right across the world. Um, and thank you all for being with us. Uh, I hope everyone enjoys the rest of the evening for those for whom it is in the evening and the weekend coming up. And Dr. Livio, thank you so much once more. Thank you very much for having me. My pleasure.